Good morning and welcome to another program, the Veterans Forum. Uh, we're coming to you from the studios of Pittsfield Community Television. Today is the 21st of October, 2009. And as usual, we have another interesting story that we think will help identify history by the people who made it. Tomorrow, the, this morning's guest is Robert Alsop. I'll stop here, let him introduce himself, tell us where he was from, and take it from there. Bob, if you will, and spell your last name for the record, please. Uh, A-L-S-O-P, Alsop. Okay. And um, I, here I am. <laughs> okay. Being interviewed by a distinguished gentleman. And um, um, how do I introduce myself? Well, this is a... Okay. What was your rank, in just a branch of service, states of service, and that sort of to kind of oh, set the stage, then we'll work Well, backwards. I was uh, in the 15th Air Force in, um, in Italy uh, in 1944, 1945, and uh, I uh, ended up as a first lieutenant. Uh, I was a, ended up as a lead navigator. Uh, I flew 31 missions with the uh, 456 Bomb Group based in Cerignola, Italy, which is down in the south of Italy. Uh, there were some great big wheat fields down there at Foggia, and um, they were readily adaptable to, uh, uh, into, into airstrips for the Air Force. And the 15th Air Force, which had come across um, North Africa, uh, uh, was based in, in uh, Foggia and Cerignola. Uh, and, um, uh, the 456 was at Cherignola, 456 bomb group, heavy as they call them. And um, we, um, I joined the, the group uh, fairly late in the war. They were involved with the Ploesti raid and uh, with uh, also with um, the missions um, uh, at Monte Cassino, Ooh. where um, um, where the Air Force was finally brought in to uh, bomb. Uh, the uh, Germans, which were dug in on at the top, at the top uh, near yeah. the near the monastery, okay. um, but um, it was a it was a very good, um, a high highly thought of bomb group, uh, with uh, a good record. They had the presidential citation, and um, um, the, the commanding officer of the group was uh, Colonel Thomas W. Steed from from Ottawa, Tennessee, and uh, he always wore. A, a, a red scarf wrapped around his neck, uh, and uh, when he uh, uh, came to, a, when he went to a briefing before a mission early in the morning, uh, he was an imposing figure. Oh, good! And uh, um, uh, had a very good record. He he flew a lot of the bad missions, the tough missions, and uh, was very highly respected by good. by the men. We lost 100 percent of the squadron in the time I was there. Um, they, of course, we kept it full with replacements. Oh, yeah. Repo Depot Specials. Yeah, and um, um, it, um, well, they used to say that, um, that uh, one third of people who went into the cadets died in training, and one third uh, uh, died in combat, and one third survived. That was a theory. That doesn't quite add up, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, pretty well, close. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good number. It's an Air Force. It's a number. good number, yeah. No. <laughs> If you will, I'd like to go stop back now that we've some idea what your, your big focus was. Uh, a little family history, like where and when were you born, what was your family life, brothers and sisters and so forth, growing up prior to your entering into college or Well, I, I was born on the kitchen table in the house in Old Roaring Brook Road in Mount Kisco, New York. Uh, do you need the date? I the mean, date, yeah. I'm only 86 instead of 68, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, January 22, 1923, in a snowstorm. And my brother hitched up a horse we had and a toboggan, went out to the main road to get Dr. I've forgotten his name. Anyway, he came and delivered me. Okay. And that's, I've been pooping along ever since. Okay. Now, how was it growing up like that? Now, for your family life, a little bit like your brothers and sisters, what was your dad well, doing? Well, I was the so youngest. I, there was my an older brother and two older sisters. <clears throat> And, um, um, and then my family were divorced about then, were pretty, pretty close after me. I was probably in a, an attempt at a rapprochement or something like oh. that, and, uh, which didn't work, I guess. And um, um, then the Depression came, and there was a crash, 
and a whole lot of folks, including us, lost everything we had. It's pretty close, anyway. And uh, we moved up to Milton, Massachusetts, and rented a small house there, up on Highland Street, as a matter of fact. And, um, and then um, I went to the day school, and, um, um, and then and, um, uh, my mother married again an Englishman, and I was, uh, went to school in Switzerland for a brief period. Um, nobody spoke any English, and I didn't speak any French. It was an interesting time, and I learned how to ski. Uh, and then um, my stepfather heard that I wasn't learning anything and <laughs> brought me back to England and put me into an English public school. And uh, I went there for three years. And when the war broke out in September 1939, that is the war in England, Europe, um, I was in America, and my father put me back at school in, in, in Milton. Milton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Milton Academy. The Milton Academy, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'm a, um, uh, in other words, I, I am an alumni of the same school that our governor is an alumni of, Governor Patrick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> and, um, Does he uh, know you're here? Uh, he doesn't know I'm here in this public arena, but... Okay. <laughs> we'll get to it. <laughs> He, uh, uh, I just um, had to contact him this, this year because uh, my granddaughter wanted to get married on a mountain in Turingham Valley, and um, uh, she couldn't find anybody to marry her, so she asked me if I would. And I uh, said I wasn't a justice of the peace and that I was not also a, a priest, so I couldn't do it. And she said, ha-ha, Grandpa, I've Googled you. And uh, uh, there is a special dis uh, law in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You apply to the governor, and if he's so uh, inclined, he will appoint you oh. for one day and for one marriage. And I got appointed by Governor Patrick. So, oh, so you're legal. I'm legal. <laughs> <laughs> and the marriage will be legal. And the Latin marriage is legal, oh, yes. Good. Good. And that child at the moment is in an airplane flying across the Pacific going with her husband to Australia to visit his family because he oh. is an Australian. And she won't be landing in Melbourne for another couple of hours. That's a long haul. It's a long haul. Yeah. A long haul. A long way. Okay. Well, growing up, what, what was your life in school? And uh, from, I say, public school, did you attend college? Or when before you got into the service, what was your education? I, uh, I, um, I went to college. Uh, I was... I'd, finished a freshman year and um, uh, was in the middle of my sophomore year. Okay, when and that I was the school? Harvard, Harvard. Harvard, Harvard okay. yeah. And uh, we, uh, I went into the ROTC and um, uh, it was a field artillery unit. And we field artillery? Uh, okay, excuse me. Yeah, it was field <laughs> artillery. And we would uh, learn how to set up the guns and stuff like that. Um, and aim them all at Elliott House across the river. Oh. <laughs> Now, you, you, when we're talking in the green room, you're telling me one of the uh, mechanisms by which you had to do your cutting and setting of your fuses. Tell that to the gang. Oh, well, you know. It's interesting. Well, uh, they, we had French 75s, and the French have a lot of panache, and they always believed that the enemy was um, uh, in retreat. And uh, if you are chasing the enemy or following after them in hot pursuit, uh, you and you, uh, uh, you have to set, reset your, your shell in the fuse box, and it's an easy uh, step to just shove it down in the fuse box and push it, turn it slightly, and shove it into the breech of the gun, and the uh, shell will uh, uh, theoretically go where it's supposed to go in hot pursuit. But if the enemy comes at you, then you have to put the shell into the fuse box and go 360 degrees and before you reset because you're bringing it down. And um, uh, that takes time. And the time involved in setting a shell where uh, the, the range is decreasing um, is uh, pretty close to something like uh, 20, min uh, 20 seconds or okay. something like that. Right. And um, uh, we, this was very helpful. Uh, to me once in my first lead mission of the bomb group off um, a target in, near Vienna. I think it was the uh, Wiener Neustadt oil refinery. And uh, the, the, um, 
I, we were, I was flying in Abel 11, which is the lead plane of the, of the bomb group. And uh, I suggested to the uh, colonel that um, uh, instead of just rallying gradually off the target, which had been our, our practice up until that time, that we go into as steep a, a dive as possible. Well, you can't dive a B-24, but you can, you can come off lose faster. Health, you yeah. can lose altitude faster than normal. And, um, and also in tight formation. And, um, and make a hard left turn off the target. Stay on that course for 19 seconds, which oh, is the that, time okay. that uh, the um, intelligence officer had told me was what it takes for a German uh, 120 millimeter radar controlled gun to get up to your altitude, which was around at that point probably 25,000 feet, something like that, 26, five, and um, and then you'd make a hard right turn okay, right. 19 seconds later and go off the other way and then back again, and we came off that target without a hit. We didn't get a touch. We weren't touched with any flag, except possibly Dog Seven, the last plane. Yeah, got and Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, if that I learned that was a helpful uh, thing that came from the field officer. Yeah, but that's that becomes standard ops as far as your flight went. I uh, it sta was standard ops with me whenever I was in a lead position. Okay. I was only in a lead position uh, part of the time because uh, you would be in a lead position in the in the you'd be squadron lead, and uh, if, if your squadron was leading the bomb group, why well, then you were in the real lead position. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, your squadron was not in the lead, leading the group, why then you were really in a following position. Okay. And then also sometimes <coughs> I'd uh, become a, a member of a lead crew as they had. They had lead crews. And um, uh, we flew deputy lead quite a lot as well as lead. So uh, and sometimes we took over yeah. when the lead plane disappeared. But. Uh, uh, that was the way that went. Okay. Can we skip back a bit to uh, before you got in the service, you were in school, then ROTC, and then uh, what was your progress from ROTC through up to the declaration of war and the time that you enlisted? What was your trail of activity? Well, uh, the war broke out in, in uh, on December 1941, and I was at college at that time, and I finished my <laughs> freshman year and, uh, and went, did the first half of my sophomore year. And then I uh, volunteered in November 1942, and um, um, I went down to the um, uh, the uh, uh, Army Air Corps uh, recruiting station in Scully Square down in Boston, and um, um, they didn't have. I wanted to go in the aviation cadets, and, and they um, had no room, so they sent me off to fly and learn how to fly in the civilian pilot training program they had at Tufts and uh, uh, up at the Concord Field in New Hampshire. And first we got 50 hours of flight in, in uh, Piper Cubs on skis because it was snow winter. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, on um, 50 hours in uh, Waco biplanes, 240 horsepower Waco biplanes, open cockpits. And those were, those were a lot of fun. Because uh, you, they were acrobatic planes. You could flip all over. The you place. could do everything with them. There was nothing you couldn't do with yeah. a with a Waco. And walk away. And, uh, and walk away. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they had, were on skis. And of course, uh, skis gave you a lift because the ski is uh, there's an elastic band going up here, oh. <laughs> holding it up. And when you come in to land, it hit you hit the bottom of the ski and it flops down. So that you have about 18 inches to fool around with, and the, inspect the instructor doesn't know what you're doing. So. No pancakes. No. Just, <laughs> just smooth in and out. Huh? Yeah. No, it's, it's easier to, uh, to land a, a plane on skis than it is to uh, do it on regular wheels. Sound like those Swiss uh, Army rescues up, you know, fly into a glacier, land, turn around, and scoot back well, out. Well, I suppose they do, yeah. I hadn't, That's a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then where did you go? Well, then my old man uh, saw me in this green uniform that I was in, and not that one, and thought I ought to get my butt into something more um, presentable, like the Navy or the Army or the Air Force. So I went back to Scully Square and said, hey, how about calling me up? And uh, I was called up into the cadets. And uh, 
but first I went to basic training in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then to um, Fenn College in Cleveland, Ohio, for some pre-flight training and what have you. And then I went, ended up at San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center, otherwise known as the SAC. And um, um, I was classified, you, you went through classification there. They examined you and you did physical, uh, got physicals and you had, um, they, they studied to see whether you were suitable to be a fighter pilot or, mm -hmm, yeah. or something else. And um, I, of course, thought I was gonna be a fighter pilot because I thought I was the hardest thing but it ever came uh, down Don't the we pike. all? <laughs> 23 and <laughs> yeah. invincible. Yeah, I had 100 hours, by goodness. And, um, um, but um, they also classified me as navigator because I'd been to college. I'd only had one year of college, but uh, they said that I would be a... That'll teach you. That'll teach you, yeah. And, of course, they, they called the first 300 names... Uh, and sent us to navigation school, and that's how I ended up as a navigator. Okay. So you were a selected volunteer. I was a, a selected volunteer, okay. yes. Now, how long did you have to spend in uh, navigation school? Well, first and you went to... the training like? Yeah, you went to pre-flight. Um, that was uh, at Selman Field in Monroe, Louisiana. And um, that was sort of like an officer's candidate school, I guess. Uh, I mean, it was a lot of uh, that sort of training, military training, mm -hmm. as opposed to... Uh, and as a matter of fact, I, I was uh, made the second in command of the squadron because um, I'd had all this ROTC stuff. So good. Uh, I remember I met a guy in a bar in Italy later on in the war, and he said I was a real. Well, I don't think I can use the language on this yeah. phone book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but beep, in the end, beep, after a beep. couple of drinks, yeah. he forgot, forgave me. <laughs> but you were real buddies. Uh, yeah. And after that, we, I went to uh, uh, navigation school at, at San Marcos in Texas. And, um, uh, and then when you finish that program, th that program used uh, AT-11s. They were small twin-engine planes, and you bounced around uh, Texas at about 5,000 feet and uh, did, uh, uh, you know, navigation with a pencil and a map and looking at... In, looking at uh, instructions and regulations and what have you, and the plane would go up and it would go down. And uh, everybody was very uh, airsick. All the, but uh, I've never been airsick since. It's a grueling experience. Yeah. But once you go through that, you're, you're completely over it. Now you were telling me the, before you did some, your last training flight was a celestial navigation bit. Oh. Bring, bring that up, because a lot of guys will oh, remember those yeah. kinds of exercises. Well, we, uh, I joined a crew in Westover Field, and um, we used to go fly all over New England, up and down the Sound, etc. cetera. And, um, and the last navigational training flight we had was a flight uh, straight out over Boston, about 500 miles to a set of coordinates, I think south of Cape Race, I think it, it was. was. And then we turn around and come back. And uh, on the way out, uh, I shot three uh, fixes, uh, um, which everything worked out fine. We were on course. And uh, in the flight out, uh, I used the North Star as um, the um, star that would give us a course line. OK, your a, aiming point. Uh, you yeah, 90 degrees. Yeah. And um, um, that worked fine, but when I got to the to the turning point, we were coming back, the North Star had sunk down below the horizon. And uh, so I had to find something else. And I used Antares, which is a somewhat reddish star in the Scorpion in the Southern Hemisphere. It's within uh, 10 degrees of the South Pole. And uh, I shot a fix using Antares for the uh, course line, mm -hmm. east and west. Yeah. And, um, uh, it was a heck of a bad fix, and it was a great big thing, and I couldn't understand it, and I reworked the figures, and I uh, uh, didn't, couldn't improve the fix. And meanwhile, we were flying westward in the night. And uh, uh, so I went back up into the turret to, uh, uh, to make another fix. We had these beautiful little uh, bubble sextants, 
and uh, you would shoot over a two-minute year, two minute period because okay. to average, yeah, average out, out yeah. the uh, effects because of the rolling of the plane. They uh, were different than the Navy. Uh, well, uh, yeah, naval sextants are, um, or used to be anyway, um, uh, an ordinary horizon sextant. Um, and uh, so I went up there and I, I looked at the south, to the south at Antares and saw this red star blinking in the southern hemisphere. And um, then I noticed that there was a reflection of uh, either a tail light or a wing light uh, on the dome of the... Uh, on your bubble? On, uh, on, on the, not on the, in the section, but on the, in the dome of, yeah. the, um, of, of my head. And uh, I realized then that probably what I'd done was to shoot the reflection of the tail light. <laughs> <laughs> it never moved. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I reshot the, the fix, and uh, this time shooting Antares, and went down, and we had a beautiful fix. Meanwhile, we'd been covered quite a lot of land, uh, ocean at this point. And, um, um, uh, but the fix came out right, and I, I called up the first pilot, and I said, Frank, uh, uh, could you alter course 12 degrees right, please? Mm. Uh, and we did, and we came in over the state house uh, on time. But, but uh, it was uh, nobody knew but me that okay. we'd been on a major. And the man screw up, up above. Yes, and the man up above. Yes. Yeah. So I got away with it. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Now, when after you got your crew formed up, when did you leave the states to go overseas? Well, um, they, we did not fly over. Oh. Um, my brother-in-law, incidentally, who had joined the Air Corps a couple of years before me and was a, a lead a first pilot, um, um, flew uh, from uh, um, Goose Bay, is it, up there in the up north? In Labrador. Labrador, to England. And um, uh, his flight was uh, put down because um, of sabotage. And uh, the second time it was put down because of sabotage. And the third time, uh, they disappeared and were never seen again. Oh. It was nasty, very nasty. Like Tommy Dorsey. Leaving two kids, etc., and my sister. <clears throat> but uh, I was sent over by ship from uh, Patrick Henry, down, Fort Patrick Henry, down at New, near Newport News. Mm -hmm. And it took us a month to get over overseas. Zigzagging or just we a slow boat? We a huge convoy. Oh. Um, and um, you went the speed of the slowest vessel. Yeah. And there were destroyers on on either side, way out. Occasionally, you'd hear them, there'd be some sort of an alert, and you'd get up on deck. But the rest of the time, you, uh, you just sort of slept and ate and did nothing for about a month. Uh, there was a, I used to climb up on the top of the, the um, there was a pile of life rafts forward and a pile uh, on, the, on a hatch uh, aft. And I would climb up there, and you'd go to sleep in the top. Oh. Uh, uh, life raft. Nobody knew where you were. <laughs> <laughs> Another down, place to go was to go down onto the fantail down below, which was reserved for the crew. Sometimes they let you sit there and look out at the wake. I went on for a long time. Thirty days to get from here. Where, well, we where went finally, in England? Finally, Southampton. Something? No, no, we didn't go to England. We went uh, into the Med, into the Mediterranean. Oh, okay. Right. And uh, the first site of land was uh, the Straits of Gibraltar. And then, you know, then after that, you thought you were there, and it was uh, another couple of weeks, to, or another week, I guess, going in the Mediterranean. I suppose the, the, the convoy must have split up there, some going north and mm -hmm. some. Um, and finally, um, um, I turned up through a strait uh, with a very high mountain on the left that looked like Mount Fujiyama, but was actually Mount Etna in Sicily, and uh, the Italian mainland. And we docked in Naples. So uh, that was uh, uh, interesting. It was very, very beautiful while we were going through that strait. These little bum boats would come out with guys calling, asking for cigarettes and stuff. And oh, yeah. Sort of flying, going, sailing along beside you. Um, when, you that, when you landed, were you at, what's, I can't pronounce it right, but Fuji or Fuji? Was uh, that where your ultimately was stationed, wasn't it? Uh, we uh, we flew were flown over to the base of uh, our bomb group, which was in, near Foggia. Foggia. Um, and Sharignola, 
um, which is on the um, uh, east side, southeast side of the Italian peninsula, s near the spur of the Italian oh, the boot, boot, so to speak. Okay. And uh, there were, used to be great big wheat fields there. There probably are now. And um, uh, they were ideal for, for landing strip. The 456 bomb group uh, um, uh, had been across North Africa, had been a part of the whole North African campaign, and had been involved with, um, with Ploesti. They had oh, been on the Ploesti The oil race. fields. Yeah, the oil fields. And they were commanded, I don't know that I said this, but by Thomas W. Steed of Etowah, Tennessee, Colonel Steed. He was a very fine The red officer. bandana guy. And, yeah, the red bandana. He had a scarf around it, a red scarf that he wore. And uh, uh, I, my, my first mission, when uh, they took the lead pilot, the first pilot and me, uh, and took us out of the crew that we were in and put us in, another, in an experienced crew, and we went to briefing very early in the morning. And the map was up there. It was a map of Europe. And there was a red line, a uh, piece of cotton wool, you know, red yarn, yarn coming down from um, somewhere on the coast of the channel, um, down, um, uh, well, down to the Swiss border. And um, uh, this was December 17, uh, 1944. And uh, it was the day when the Germans made their last major push uh, and the Battle of the Bulge mm -hmm. began on that day and um, um, we, uh, we were on, that, on the mission, of my first mission, it was to a, an oil, oil refinery uh, high up in Silesia uh, on the Oda River, Oda Tall, and um, it was a long flight, a long, a long way, and we went deep up up there, and, and um, we, uh, everything went all right. There was uh, uh, one extraordinary event was that uh, we didn't have a fighter touch, touch us or come anywhere near us, and we were way up. We, I mean, we, our fighter protection uh, uh, at that time, uh, P-51s and P-38s, uh, didn't extend further than, than the, the foothills of the Alps, really. Not much up, up in the, mm. over the Alps slightly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we were way beyond that. We'd, we were way up north of, of Austria, north of Czechoslovakia, north of Czechoslovakia in, in Silesia, which has uh, been a part of Germany for a long time. It's now a part of Poland. Um, <laughs> but um, um, we later learned that the reason we weren't attacked was because the Germans were very angry at a particular bomb group. And um, one of the members of the bomb group had uh, been on a mission and had been badly shot up. And he had wounded men aboard and, and uh, uh, lost an engine and maybe a second. Uh, and uh, he surrendered in the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Germans left him with one fighter plane guide, yep. to guide him down to a German field. <laughs> and the story is that he ordered his boys to shoot the guy out of the sky oh. and when he was close aboard and, um, and got back. Well, he was court-martialed, I'm told, and was sent back to the States in disgrace. And um, uh, but, so the Germans on my first mission were taking off after that bomb group. And, uh, you blame them? No, I don't. Uh, it was uh, uh, a very unfortunate thing. It, it, it's, what do you do if you've got wounded men aboard? And yeah. It's a desperate, oh, yeah. desperate situation. Anyway, that's what happened. And, uh, so now, was the German that, killed? Did he go down? Or oh, yeah, he was shot. He didn't shoot out? No, he was, he was killed. Oh, OK. Uh, and um, uh, so. But um, uh, those sort of things happen. That, the, um, um, there's a lot of firepower in a B-24. The twin 50 caliber guns in the nose and twin 50 caliber guns in the tail and twin 50s up on the up Martin upper turret 
and uh, the sperry ball down below, and then single fifties on either side in the waist. And so it's quite a lot of firepower. Uh, there was a story about at the end of the war, just before the Castle Rings surrendered in April of 45, um, it was a mission to, um, um, I think it was to Linz on the Danube. And uh, at this point, the Russians had already just taken Vienna. And um, uh, Patton was uh, t getting into Czechoslovakia. Mm. He'd taken Regensburg and he was up in, so that the German forces had been really pinched, really pinched, pinched in. And uh, their, their uh, mobile artillery, uh, railroad guns, uh, had been brought back in so that the, the information that we had about the, the defenses of, of target areas were, were out of date. I mean, instead of there being 30, 88s, there might have been... Uh, 100. Yeah, I mean... Uh, and heavier guns than that, the 120 millimeter jobs. And um, um, anyway, this guy, his name was Misma. He lived in a tent down the road from me. And his, he uh, came off of this target completely shot up. I mean, he'd lost one engine. He had uh, uh, three or four guys that had been badly hurt. And um, uh, his other engine was not uh, behaving too well, luckily on the other side. And um, he, um, he said, well, hell, I'm going to go and land this thing in Vienna. It was the closest field. Oh. But it was off, off limits. The Russians had, had, uh, had issued orders that it, the field was closed. No fly zone. And no fly zone. Absolutely no Americans. And uh, he said, uh, heck with them. Yes. And uh, put it into a long glide from, from Linz to Vienna. It probably wasn't more than about, I don't know, 60 miles or something. And um, he coasted right in. He was uh, a couple of Russian yaks uh, warned, tried to warn him off, uh, so I'm told. And um, he went in there and, and did a beautiful landing and uh, coasted to the end of the runway and then pulled off. And he uh, uh, stopped the plane and um, uh, opened the bomb bays. He kept his two inboard fans going. So he had power, and he walked, climbed down out of the plane, expecting somebody to send a car out to tell him what to do. And uh, uh, pretty soon, four or five trucks appeared on the horizon, uh, loaded with Russian troops. And they stopped about a reasonable distance away, and, and they unloaded and started to advance on the plane with a skirmish line. So he thought this wasn't a very good. Yeah, not a welcoming of, committee. Not a welcoming committee, and he didn't know what to do. But uh, this was the end of the road. So he climbed back into the plane. He had power because he had these two inboard uh, engines oh, going. going. Yeah. And um, he uh, got the guy back, uh, gunners back into the turrets. And he could bring, bring um, the two nose 50s to bear and the Martin upper 50 okay, to bear, to and maybe the tail, I'm not sure, right? okay. or one in the, one, in the waist. One, and uh, he said, look, give them a burst, but don't aim at them. Make it <laughs> way up yeah. in the air somewhere. Well, uh, it makes a hell of a noise, uh, uh, seven or eight uh, 50 caliber machine guns on the ground like that. And uh, he, they let out this burst, and the Russian soldiers climbed back in the trucks and. <laughs> and headed back to operations. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, a jeep came out, and there was a major, and they apologized. And okay. But he figures he would have been killed. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, it was, it was, that's an interesting sort of an episode. Yeah. And he got home. Yeah. Yeah. These are the things that fellows like yourself have been sharing with us in this program, and, and some of it will never make a history book, but yeah. God dang it, it's good history. Well, oh. it was, it, I mean, he obviously, uh, he was a gutsy fella. Oh, yeah. And um, he uh, did a, he survived because of it. Yeah. Uh, interesting, interesting. Now, you yeah. said you had, what, 31 or 32 missions? 31. Mm -hmm. OK. 31 missions, yeah. Any particular one that stands out? I, it's a dumb question, I know, but uh, well, if good um, memories or bad memories, it's up to you. Um, let's see here. Uh, like, I, I've written all this stuff up, oh. you know, just to see what was going on. 
Uh, there are amusing things, but I'll... No, uh, I'll, it doesn't hurt to make light of it sometime. The lighter side, you know. Well, there's a good deal of some rugged language in <laughs> Mom, we can bleep it. <laughs> uh, let's see, where am I? Um, oh, there were things like, um, well, when we were thrown right down into the, into the mud on that field at Sherignola, they just threw this big old tent out, big hump. And um, we set up the tent, and, and we noticed that all the other tents that had been there for a while were really quite comfortable. They had sort of uh, frame, stone two by, yeah. frames oh, around yeah. them made out of this Italian <coughs> stone called, I think, tufi or something like that, tufi blocks. And they had stoves in the middle set in, in these blocks, the field of stone, mm -hmm. a 50, half a 50-gallon drum, and then the, the, uh, the um, chimney was made out of spam cans. You cut the corners of all the spam yeah, cans and, them and should put them together, and they went out. Yeah. And then there was a 100-gallon tank outside with a, a mixture of, of um, fuel oil and 80-octane gasoline mixed. And it would come in on a, uh, an aluminum tube from some crashed B-24 and drip into a little pan of stones. Mm, and that was your fire. And that was a fire. And it, was, it really was a great thing. Uh, uh, except one night, um, I guess we, uh, it burned too hot and uh, it melted the aluminum at the end of the tube. And, and then it kind of spread. It burst out yeah. <laughs> under the pressure and it blew. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the tank went up in the air and the gravel went all over the tent and the spam cans went all over the tent and I dove under my cot. <laughs> oh, what protection that would do, no, I don't know. The whole squadron not, dove under yeah. the cot. <laughs> it was an interesting yeah. episode. But we had things like that occasionally. But there was one tale that I thought um, might be amusing. Um, well, I went on a left rest leave to Rome and um, with a whole bunch of guys and the, the Air Force had um, uh, flew into the airfield at Rome and they had um, um, uh, a little shack on the opposite side of the field from the regular operations building. And the, um, the uh, uh, operations building at Rome Airport was a very distinguished building built by Mussolini with a great window looking out, mm -hmm. curving window looking out over the field. And um, uh, that had been reserved for, for the uh, high brass uh, operating in the British and American Army. And um, uh, anyway, we, but the air crews used to be picked up at this little shack on the other side of the airport. Well, I came out in the truck with the rest of the boys and the plane came up uh, from our squadron. It was Major Richards, the operations officer. And he was one parachute short. And the um, Air Force, at least under those conditions, they refused to fly. Uh, it'll take you on board if you, if, without a parachute. Mm -hmm. And so Richard said, um, well, Bob, you, can, you stay another night. And I'll come up and pick you up tomorrow. And. Um, um, I said, all right. So I went back into Rome and, and um, suffered suffered for another evening at a Red Cross restaurant or something like that. And um, um, the, um, uh, what was that picture? The, um, It's well documented. Huh? Yeah, I got this all arranged uh, very efficiently so that everything would be ready when I <laughs> needed it. Here she here it must be here. Anyway, I hitched a ride out the next day to the operations office. He told me he'd pick me up at the main main uh, at the main building. It's a big high ceilinged waiting observation room with a long, curving window looking out on the, onto the tarmac. As I entered the room, a loudspeaker announced that a general officer's aircraft was ready for boarding, and would he and his staff please proceed to gate number one. A C-47, DC-3, that's a twin-engine old oh, yeah. flight plane, 
had pulled up to the gate and its two engines were turning as it waited for its passengers. There was a flurry of battle jackets with a flash of red here and there on the hats of the senior British staff. And I drew discreetly off to one side. I was a first lieutenant at the time, so mm. I was somewhat underranked. Uh, I saw nobody under the rank of full colonel, and I waited for Major Richards to arrive. Every few minutes, the loudspeaker would announce a new departure, and a small plane would pull up and pick up a brigadier or other senior officer. Suddenly, a growing roar could be heard, and people's heads turned to see what was happening. It was Major Richards, uh, Richards as he brought his four-engine B-24 right up to the middle of the glass observation window. Then he gunned it around with a thunder that practically blew the glass in. And there for all to see on the nose of that B-24 was the life-size pic picture of baby boots. An Esquire sent a fold, if there ever was one. <laughs> yeah. A beautiful girl with a shock of gold hair, her only clothing an RAF sheepskin flight jacket wide open at the front, but demurely held together lower down and a pair of sheepskin flying boots. The loudspeaker called out for Lieutenant Alsop to report to his aircraft at Gate 1. It was a high point in my military career as I walked across the room with a subdued expression of importance on my face. But the truth of the matter was that all the brass were looking at was baby boots. And here <laughs> she is, <laughs> uh, without much on. <laughs> oh, I don't think we, Jeff, do you think we can get that, Carol? If we hold it up, yeah, this is history. It, uh, would you, if you, uh, you can spot yourself on that. And there we go. She was a beautiful picture. <laughs> oh, hold it a little bit longer so we can hold it. There we go. That's Boots. <laughs> boots, O-O-T-S. <laughs> war was hell, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a rough war. <laughs> but anyway. She survived, I guess. Yeah, you did too. That's yeah. good. Now, uh, we talked earlier that uh, you were married, I believe, while you were in the service and so on, or just before you went into the service? I was married before I went into the service. Okay. So, uh, uh, and while I was over there, uh, December, 7th, December, um, December 19th, 1944, we had a Christmas party in the officers club, which was a shack with uh, a little bar in it. And, and uh, there were about 200 Air Corps officers. Uh, there, was, uh, uh, there were three Red Cross girls. <laughs> and uh, my wife's first cousin was in the Red Cross down in Bari. And she'd come up on a truck. And uh, uh, so uh, there were a couple of English uh, nurses uh, and uh, my, uh, practically everybody was <laughs> was pie-eyed. You mean they overindulged? Overindulged. And uh, but everybody treated me very well because I had uh, this cousin of my wife's, oh. who was a very pretty girl, and uh, is a very pretty girl. Um, and she, uh, the colonel, uh, actually it wasn't a, he wasn't a colonel then. It was Major Parks, our squadron commander, um, took her in tow. So, uh, I, so she's well escorted. Yeah, so he lent me his jeep to go get her. And oh, things like rough! That. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Oh. Uh, but um, when well, did you return to the states at the end of UL on your way home, had been discharged? Um, I returned um, in the um, well before I go to the end oh, of that. Okay, story. I can tell you uh, one story that I think was was sort of fun. Uh, we uh, the Germans were. This is before I became a lead navigator. It was still just an uh, ordinary navigator. Um, our bombardier was wounded. Um, a burst of flak came through the plane and cut his forehead. And uh, there was blood all over the place. But we, we, uh, he was OK. But he was in the hospital. And so we didn't have a bombardier. And I, was, uh, I took over the job as an uh, extra thing to do. And um, we went on a mission to um, Regensburg. Uh, the Germans were developing uh, fighter, uh, uh, jet fighters mm -hmm. at the Regensburg field. We went over on a 12-foot ship front. That's um, uh, a little less than the full group. 
but it was um, uh, two rows of B-24s, 12 ships wide. And we had, we were carrying newly developed fragmentation bombs that were in a cluster of uh, six mm -hmm. of these little small things in a, in a... Canisters? Well, they, they, they was, they had little propellers on the front. And the theory was that, um, um, and they had wires keeping the propellers from turning at altitude. But when they dropped out, the wires pulled, them out. pulled out. They armed them. They thing. armed them. And um, <clears throat> they were designed to explode in the air above the ground at about um, 50 or 100 feet, um, 50 feet probably. Okay. Um, uh, they were anti-personnel type bombs. Oh, yeah. Nasty, really nasty. And um, uh, well, anyway, on this particular mission, after, as we rallied off the target, the, the uh, chief engineer in the back, um, in the waist, called me up and said, um, one of those things is hung up in the, in the, in the bomb bay. Oh. <laughs> and um, what do we do? So uh, he and I met uh, back there on the catwalk. We were about 25,000 feet over Bavaria. Um, and the bomb bays were open. And of course, and the pilot was calling for me to close, get the hell out of there. Yeah. Button because, it up. <laughs> yeah, button it up because um, they wanted, we were losing uh, our position in the group from the, uh, from the bomb base being open, the, the air drag. resistant, the drag. And um, well, we wired it up and um, we thought that we, everything was okay. And we went, I went forward and um, we came down over the Adriatic eventually, and um, um, we were down to about 10,000, so I didn't need oxygen and what have you. So I, I went back to get rid of it. And we got out over the Adriatic, and um, um, uh, we opened the bomb bay. No, before we opened the bomb bays, uh, I put one foot on the bomb bays and one foot on the catwalk and reached up to, to um, um, See, bring, carry, see, release the bomb. Mm -hmm. And I brought it back down onto the catwalk. It weighed 165 pounds. And uh, it really uh, was a, a heavy thing uh, for me to hold. And, um, and uh, then I looked up at the co pilot who was looking down the, from the up forward, laughing. <laughs> and I asked him to open the bomb base. He opened the bomb base. And I, reached back and, and kicked the damn bomb out into space. And uh, I forgot that all I had on my feet were these uh, sheepskin boots. And um, uh, I broke my toe. Oh, and gave the, you all for the company. <laughs> the bomb blew up about 5,000 feet below us. And, uh, and, the, and the, the nurse, uh, when I reported for medical pro <laughs> I hoped I was going to get the uh, well, I mean, at least the Purple Heart. At least. At least. Uh, all she did was uh, pat me on the back and, and bandage me up and certify me fit for combat. Fit for combat. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that was, yeah. that's, that's called concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, now, it was, to that point, though, did you have to bail out? I never yeah. did, though. Uh, on one mission, we thought we were going to have to. We thought um, uh, it had been a long mission, and... Uh, and um, we had rallied right off the target at near in Vienna, an oil refinery, and it made a wide sweep, which used up more gas. And the the, um, the gauges were saying we only had enough gas for such and such a distance, and I figured we were half an hour short. So I went back up to uh, crawled up the tunnel and talked to the pilot and said, uh, "We've had it. We'd get get we we'd better get down over southern Yugoslavia because." Um, in those days, um, if you bailed in Croatia, um, that was um, a very strongly German um, favorable area. They, they, they had been... They turn you in quickly. They, they don't even turn you in. They pull you apart with oh. uh, teams of horses and oh. very nasty things. So Croatia was not a, up where the Sava and the Drava River are. is not a happy place to bail out. And... Um, but if you got down to where Tito and, and um, Mihailovic, the, uh, the partisan fellows were in the south, 
in the mountains down there that you were apt to be uh, treated pretty well and, and eventually get back to Italy. Good. Um, so that's where we were aimed. And then finally the engineer discovered that the, that his, the gauges had been frozen and that we actually had enough, enough oh. gas and we got home. So we didn't have to bail. One of the but, fellows uh, to precede you was uh, in that same position. They are coming back from a raid. This is his 32nd and a half. They didn't yeah. they had to bail out. And I said, how'd you feel? He said, I was scared. He said, 6,000 feet, I can't swim. <laughs> but they, they ditched and he finally got back. But, uh, but yeah. Just the look on his face. And I said, now, how were you sprayed up to? Well, I was the last one out because he was a radio navigator or some damn thing. The biggest problem he had was to remember to put his shoot on because it took him off when they were working. Yeah, right. Yeah. Did you have the same problem? Were you out on the bank? Oh, no, we had these uh, uh, front, front Okay. The only people with backpacks were the pilots. Two pilots. No, okay. But um, no, we didn't have them on. Well, we just had the harness on. All right, mm -hmm. and just snap them on yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, this has been yeah. quick. Now, we have some time, but I'd like, as we talked before, would you show us one or two of your. your plots as to what you were assigned and how you were used them to do your thing. Well, um, um, anyone would be fine, I think. Well, this is a Oops. flak map, um, which uh, they gave us these uh, for most areas. Um, and um, they show the, um, show the, uh, Areas which um, yeah, I'll hold part of. Here. Can you which, get a good shot of that, Carol? There we go. All right. Where where uh, flak uh, well, the aircraft these, guns are located. These are the circles. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This happens to be a map of, of northern Italy. Um, Were they accurate? Uh, yes. Um, the um, later in in the war, when I was a lead navigator. Uh, the lead, lead planes all had uh, radar um, scopes. We had these, um, these um, radar operators, mm -hmm. a radar navigator on board to, have to assist us. And um, you, 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 as an ordinary navigator, really, we, used, we didn't use Celestial the whole time I was there. Uh, we uh, uh, just used what was dead reckoning. Which Dead is, reckoning and time to point to point. Yeah, and um, and we got to know the country absolutely by heart. I mean, uh, it's ideal country to navigate over because it's uh, f uh, got these river mount ri uh, river valleys between high mountains, and and uh, I got so that if I all I had to do was look out the window and I knew exactly where I was, um, unless of course there were cloud cover. Yeah, and um, uh, on on one mission we. We um, were coming back, and I was the lead navigator. And um, we came um, south across um, Austria. And um, uh, there's a valley there called, which, uh, with a town in it called Brook. And it's, um, it's a very um, significant cleft in the mountain, mm -hmm. so that it's very recognizable. So I had a very good fix of where I was. And we turned south. And um, we're swinging down uh, at a, for a certain length of time. We then would make it turn to the right to get back out to the Adriatic. And uh, suddenly, the other planes, the other lead planes in the squadrons behind us, started to complain that um, uh, we were flying right over the town of Zagreb, where there were s significant Supposedly. flak uh, yeah. installations. Well, actually, we were nowhere near Zagreb. We were 75 miles short of it. But they all wanted, they thought I was screwing up. And my own radar operator called me up and said, Nav, you, you're, you're taking yourself as they grab. And um, um, I, I, I refused to, to, change. to change. And the colonel went along with what I wanted to do. Cool. And, and, um, and we went straight over this thing at about 18,000 feet. And nothing happened. And, um, and then about, a few minutes later, Zagreb showed up on the on the radar screen. Um, what it, when we got to, to uh, brief the, the after the mission briefing, yeah. you know, you had, you debriefing, debriefing yeah. so to speak. Um, the intelligence officer happened to mention there were all these howls of anguish because they were mad at me. Uh, the intelligence officer said there'd been a, a, a German armored division 
uh, on rest leave in some woods in, uh, in that part of Yugoslavia. Okay, and they were picking and that we up. We were picking up yeah. the same blip on the scope uh, from that as the town of Zagreb would have. And, uh, so it's, it's interesting, uh, what did they say, garbage, uh, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the word. <laughs> I just got, excuse me, I got to cut it short a bit. I just got a flash from the man back yeah. there. We've got about two minutes to go. All right. Uh, to sum it up, uh, did you, when you came home and was discharged and so forth, take advantage of the GI Bill or anything like that? Yes, I did. I went back to college. I had the GI Bill and I went to law school. Okay. And uh, uh, my, when I finished college, I went down to see my old man. He asked me what I was going to do, and I said I was going to law school. And he said, who's paying for it? Sam. <laughs> and I said, Uncle Sam was paying for it mainly. But uh, he had been helping us out because we were married and had okay. two children. I had a child by then. And um, uh, so uh, he said, where are you going? And I said, I had been admitted to the law school. The law school. The law school. At Harvard. And um, he said, well, I'm not paying for you to go there. And I said, why not? And he said, because you're too provincial. You've never been out of New England. You don't know what you're, <laughs> what's going, what's on, going on in the world. And I thought I'd learned a good deal in Italy. Okay. But oh, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, he said, go look somewhere else. And okay. uh, so I did. I ended up at the University of Virginia, okay. which is a very good law school. And uh, I'm One here. last question, yeah. very brief. I'm, getting, I'm being flagged right now to wrap it up. But, uh, what was the, if you will, your re assessment of your military service? Was it positive or negative? It was positive. I think most people who served in World War II uh, felt it was positive. Uh, they, um, uh, everybody volunteered. We wa everybody wanted to be in that fight because it was a really desperate situation. Okay. And, and it was a different Good. from Vietnam or whatever. We've just been shot out of the sky. All I can okay. say, Bob, Thank you. Welcome home and thank you. This has been good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, folks.